Now let's turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and uh, we're continuing on with our subject, the laws of the kingdom, laws of the kingdom. And uh, I've been doing just a little bit of studying and reading uh, recently about our, our prison system. Uh, I've come across a, a wonderful book uh, written by Michelle, uh, Michelle Alexander. And the book entitled is entitled The New Jim Crow. And in it, she lists some prison stats that I found were, were, were pretty uh, uh, remarkable. In 1980, there were 513,000 people locked up in prison. In 1985, there were 759,000 people locked in prison. In 1990, there was 1.1 million people locked up in prison. In the year 2000, there was 2. million people locked in prison. In the year 2014, there was 2.3 million people locked in prison. And she goes on to state that going back to Nixon's uh, inauguration, he won that vote because of his stance on drugs, the war on drugs. Reagan then came along with a, a Just Say No campaign uh, headed by Nancy. And then Clinton came along with the Three Strikes, You're Out. And it's amazing that with the Three Strikes, You're Out, I. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail this morning, but it's interesting that with the three strikes you're out, we have people doing hard, hard time in prison because of things like uh, cannabis. Uh, they had a blunt in their pocket, and among a couple of other uh, 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 charges, you know, maybe this is their third, and they're doing long time uh, stretches in prison, and yet we today, I don't know if you've got your ballots, Deborah and I got our ballot in the mail, uh, we not only hand out cannabis cards like they're candy, uh, but now we have on the ballot a, uh, you can vote to make uh, uh, marijuana legal. So what I'm saying in saying that is that the United States, we impose a certain set of laws targeting nonviolent crimes in inner cities, and we locked up a whole lot of people. You can just tell that by the numbers, the amount of people in prison today. And yet, some years later, the very thing that we're locking folks up, and we're giving them long stretches in prison, some in life terms in prison, some of the very things, we're now changing law to where it's legal and it's acceptable. So you... If the public votes to make marijuana legal, y'all are going to be able to smoke dope legally. And uh, how many of you would agree that some laws are good, but some laws just don't make sense? 20, 30 years, and, 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 and the war on drugs and everything, it made sense at the time, but as we progress and as things change, and there are guys behind bars for something that we are now going to legalize. But here's the point, that whether it's good or it's bad, a law is a law. Whether you agree with the law or you disagree with the law, when it is law, it is law. And when you stand before the judge and you say before the judge, I don't agree with this law, and, and I don't think that I should have to follow this law, and I don't think you should be able to charge me with a crime, how many of you know that judge is not going to listen to you? You broke the law. Whether it's a crazy law or it's not a crazy law, the fact is, is that you broke the law, and when you break the law, there is a consequence to it. Now, if you go to other countries and you travel abroad, their laws are different. We, we shared this the other week. Laws are different in other countries. But because you're in a strange country and you're ignorant of that law, if you break it, guess what? You are still guilty. So in America, you might be able to throw your hamburger wrapper out your car window, and it becomes a misdemeanor charge or a, a ticket. 
But if you do that in the wrong country, you might get your hand chopped off and do a 30 years in jail, right? So when it is a law, it is a law that you have to abide by or you face a consequence. Jesus made it very clear that when he was introducing the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, he made it very clear as he taught that there are certain laws that govern his kingdom that don't necessarily govern in the world's kingdom. So the world has their own set of laws that we abide by. I mean, I try to drive the speed limit. I don't always do a good job. Uh, I try to abide by the laws of the world, so much so as they don't contradict the laws of the kingdom. But I'm very much aware that while I'm here on earth, and I'm in America, and I'm in California, that I also obey a set of laws that are of a higher caliber because they are laws in the kingdom of God. And I know that just like if I break the law here and I do 80 in a 30 mile an hour speed zone, I'm going to pay a price for it. I also know that if I break the laws within the kingdom of God, there is a price and a consequence that I am going to pay. Yes. So we started out a couple of weeks ago with the first three laws, and they are the laws of love. Uh, Jesus said, I give you a new command. I give you a command. It's not up to you whether you want to. It's not up to you whether you like the person. It's not up to you whether you feel good or feel bad. I'm giving you a command. There is no conditions to it that you love one another. You don't have a choice when it comes to loving you. You have to do it in the kingdom of God, and I have to love you. If we could understand this law, all church squabbles would stop. Amen. Because they all start with my not loving you so much and my criticizing you and my deciding that I would talk about you behind your back. Law number two was that you forgive one another. And the disciples asked the question, how many times should we forgive it? Jesus gave this ridiculous number like, dude, just don't even count them the number's so high, that's how many times you forget. Because in my kingdom, we live by a different set of laws, and I have the law, it commands me in the kingdom of God to forgive you when you offend me. I have to forgive you. I have no choice. I have to get my mind and my heart around it, and if I'm having a hard time forgiving you, I have to go to the one that gave the law in the first place and say to him, Jesus, if you want me to obey your law, which I'm trying to do, I can't stand that person. You have to give me an ability to love and to forgive. And if you'll give me the ability, I will live out your law. And he does. Because he doesn't give laws that he doesn't enable us to keep. We looked at the third law. The third law was the law of humility. I think we break this law all the time. I think, I think in the kingdom of God, we, we, we have egos running rampant. And uh, I think we break this law. I, I just think that we're a little subtle about it. Uh, we don't stand up or we don't put our ego at full force in front of people. Uh, we do it a little more subtly in that uh, I think I'm a little better than you, and uh, uh, what I have is a little better than what you have, and uh, we do not live in humility, because humility, humility would say, let me see how I can make you better than me. <laughs> let me see how I can promote your ministry yes. above my ministry. Come on. Well, let me see how I can draw light to your giftings above my giftings. Yes, and if I have something monetarily that I think could benefit you and I want to see you blessed above my being blessed, well then I think I would be giving it to you. Amen. And say, hey, 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 I, I noticed that you don't have a lot of money and I was blessed with an extra little bit of money. So let me just give you some of it 
because I so want to see you do better than me. But as long as I want to be better than you, I'm giving you nothing. Uh -oh. Because it's all about me. And I violate the law of humility. Because Jesus said when he washed the disciples' feet, he said, listen guys, watch what I'm doing. I am doing the lowest task among servants. This is as low as it gets. And listen to me. If I be Lord, can do this. How much more yeah, should you serve yeah, one another? Yeah. That's why we're washing your cars today, mm -hmm. because we want to say we serve everybody that's a part of City Church. Mm -hmm. The fourth law was the law of using your giftings. Jesus gave the parable about the man that got the five talents, the man that got the two talents, and the man that got the one talents. Uh, the man that got the five and the two, they, they both invested and they used their talents. They used what God had given them. But the person that got the one, they, they went and hit it. Mm -hmm. And they used the excuse, I knew that you were a hard master and, and you would demand a return and I didn't want to lose what you gave me. And there are people here, I don't mean in this building, but there are people in the body of Christ that God has given abilities to. Come on. Spiritual abilities, physical abilities, the ability to, 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 to do something, the ability to work with your hands, the ability uh, to be a mechanic, the, the ability to administrate. Not everybody can administrate. Uh, the ability to counsel, the ability to see things in God's Word, the, the ability to, to be an encourager. Maybe you're an encourager and people get around you and they can just feel encouraged because of your personality. And see, anybody that is in the body of Christ, you have been given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to be in the body of Christ and not have a spiritual gift by the Holy Spirit. It is impossible. Because when Paul taught on it, he said, every member supplies something to the body of Christ. Every member. What would my hand do for me if it was dead and couldn't participate with my body? It would be a hindrance. Like, I gotta, maybe I need to have a surgery and have a fake hand put on or, or something. Because if it's part of my body and it does not function, it, it, it really doesn't do me any good. In fact, in many ways, it hinders me. Well. So we have people all over the kingdom of God, all over the body of Christ, that God has planted you. He has planted you for a reason. Is it to just show up on Sunday and get a word? Is it to just show up on Sunday and sing a few songs and get your car washed and go home? Or am I here for a specific reason, having a specific gift? And I would encourage you, if you don't know what that gift is, <clears throat> that you begin to ask the Lord, Show me what my gifting is. Many times it's what you're good at. Mm -hmm. Many times it's what you do naturally. Mm -hmm. If you naturally work with your hands, I don't think, and you do not have a lick of artistic ability, God isn't going to tell you to redesign City Church. He's going to tell you to build out what they design. You see what I'm saying? There are some of you here that you're artistic. You need to go look at our foyer and tell us how to make it better because it's really ugly. I have to tell you, I admit it. That foyer needs some help and you might be sitting in here with the gifting to do it. You don't want me to design it. You've already seen what I do. It's not really good, is it? I get bright ideas like let's take out all the trees and we take them out and then somebody comes and says, why do you take all the trees out? This got ugly. Okay, let's put all the trees back. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so we need some people with those kids. And maybe you're here. And you're going, you know, I know how to do that stuff. I'm very creative. Good, we need you. All right, now we're going to go to our fifth gift. And we're going to end this Sunday. <clears throat> I'm going to give you our fifth gift. And that is the gift, the law of giving 
and receiving. The law of giving and receiving. And we're at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus says this. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Interesting. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Verse 24. He finishes this teaching right here. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, there have been a lot of teaching about money, some of it good, um, some of it bad in my opinion. Uh, there has been a lot of abuse about money, and I, I fully understand that. Uh, but I do, I do want you to know that the subject that Jesus taught most was about money. In fact, he talked more about money than he talked about the kingdom of heaven. He talked more about money than he talked about salvation. He talked more about money. I did a funeral service Friday, and, and, and it was really awesome. God's presence was here. There was some rejoicing going on. But he talked more about money than he talked about you and I dying, which we all will do one day. He talked more about money than anything. In fact, I thought this morning, Jesus, if you were pastoring a church today, nobody would go. Because you'd always be talking about money. And people would get tired of the subject matter. Pastors are afraid to talk about money because we're afraid we're going to offend you or make you think that's all we want is money. So we don't. We shy away from it. I shy away from it. I admit it. But Jesus, it was his number one subject. Why? Because money is so important. You can't live and survive very well without it. You have to pay bills. You need money to pay bills. Money is something that sustains us. Money is something that also blesses us. We, we, I, I admit, I need money. I need some money. I like money because it helps me live a little better than if I didn't have money. But when we read the text, it's interesting that when Jesus starts talking about money, sandwiched in between, don't lay up treasures for yourself on earth, but lay them up in heaven where moth and rust doesn't corrupt, it's almost as though he inserts something that initially you think this doesn't go with what you're talking about, but it really does. He inserts, but if your the eye is the window of the body, but if the eye is dark, the whole body becomes dark. But if the eye is good, the whole body is good. And then he ends up and he says, oh, by the way, you cannot serve God and man because you'll love the one and hate the other, or vice versa, you can't serve both. And I ask myself, why, why did you put in about the eye? What does that have to do with money? I believe it has everything to do with money. <clears throat> because I believe that we can take money and we can cause money to become a type of a god. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to build an idol and make it look like a dollar bill or, or a dollar sign or anything like that. But we can take money and its importance and we can elevate it in our life to where it becomes an idol. It becomes too important to us. It becomes all-consuming to us. And I believe that when Jesus is talking about the light of the eye, I, and it's in reference to money. It's in reference to what I see and what I want 
And what do I allow to rip my heart and to consume me? Now, I don't know if you've ever been consumed with getting something, uh, but I have at times in my life, I admit it. I, I, I have seen something. I, I, I've been told that something is really good, and, 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 and I've watched other people get it, and, and I've seen it at the store or on the parking lot, and I decided I want that. And, and before I knew it, I was seeing it everywhere. Everybody had one but me. And then it took a place in my heart that I had to get it because I deserve it more than they deserve it. So I've got to get a, one of those things. I've got to have it. And then I began to connive and to scheme and to think, how can I, how can I steal from here and, and take from there so that I can get it because it has entered in through my eye and it now has become a part of my spirit and it has taken a position of, in place of God. It's taken a position of God. And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, when that happens, you can't serve God and man at the same time. You, you, can I just hit home just one time? Can I just meddle just a little, little bit? John, close your ears. Dr. John, don't listen. He'll take me to lunch and tell me that I shouldn't do this. On second thought, listen, because I need a free lunch, so you can take the lunch. <laughs> So bad. You, you know that money is becoming a God. And, and be, when, when we take a deposit and you go, mm, I really wanted to go buy this. But I can't buy this if I give it in the deposit. So I'm not going to give it in the deposit because I, I really need to get that new whatever it is. And I'm trying to save to get that. That has now become more important to you. And it has elevated into a place of God. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. I've been there. I've done that. I've done that. God, you know, in order to get this, I've got to stop giving you, I've got to start giving you less. Is that okay? But I give you less because I, 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 really, I, I really need that thing. It's, I've got to have it in my life. And I've come to a place where I've realized that none of those things matter that much. None of them matter that much. They're all so temporal. I spoke to a lady Friday when I was doing the memorial service. She sat right there, sang a song. Afterwards, I said, that was a real beautiful song. She said to me, she said, you know, what you share, I, I really identified with it, really blessed me. I, I could tell because she was about ready to jump out of her chair. And I thought, wow, it, something's hit home with her. But, but she came up to me and she said, she said, I... I almost died a few years ago. I committed suicide, and uh, they saved me at just the nick of time. She said, but when I was dying, in the middle of dying, she said, I realized that in that state of dying, I knew my life was leaving me. She said, I felt this overwhelming feeling that nothing mattered. All those things that I thought was so important, nothing really mattered. Matter. It is so temporary. I sat in a convention a couple of weeks ago, and it was so professional, and everything was so beautiful, and it was really good. And, uh, big names were there. I mean, some big name speakers were there, and and, uh, and I sat there, and I felt the Lord spoke to me because I felt a tinge of jealousy. Can I just say that I felt a tinge of jealousy? Uh, uh, sitting in a midst with room in a room with pastors that pastor three, five, ten, twenty thousand people, and, and I, I not twenty, eighteen. Uh, I, I felt a, a tinge of jealousy, and the Lord spoke to me and said, "Does it matter?" I said, "Well, according to everybody in this room, it does." And He says, "When you die." And they die. Will anybody remember? And I said, no. Maybe my kids will remember. But people really will not remember. 20 years after your death, will they, anybody remember what you did? You, you won't even make a history book. And I said, nobody will remember. He said, the only thing that counts in life 
isn't the fame, isn't likes, the, it, it, it isn't notoriety. The only thing that counts in life is what you do for me, and I say well done at the end of your life, and never lose focus on that. Now, when God spoke that to me, let me tell you, I did some very quick repenting and changed my paradigm immediately. There is only one thing that matters, and that's what I do for Him, what I do for the kingdom of heaven, whether you remember it or you don't remember it. And I promise you, after my death, you ain't going to remember squat. But when I stand before Him, He remembers it. And I get it well done from him. Yes. That is everything yes. in life right there. Yes. Yes. So when it comes to money, what place does that play in your heart? Only you can answer that. There are some, I would, I would guess, that are sitting here today where it, it, it's very important to you. So much so that if God asked you to buy somebody lunch today, you'd have a meltdown. Lord, Lord, help you if he asked you to give everything in your wallet to somebody in need. You'd, you'd have a major meltdown. We'd have to pray deliverance over you right here. You'd fall out. <laughs> what place does it play in your heart? Now, here's, here's where the law comes in. Because God blesses based on how you use it. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 1 says this. Cast your bread upon the water, for after many days you will find it again. It is called the law of sowing and reaping. I cannot reap what I have not sown. I, I have to be able to sow in order to reap. And Solomon here says, throw your bread out. Cast it out, and after a while, it will come back to you. Malachi goes on to tell us how it will come back. It will come back because other people will start giving and pouring out into your bosom or into your lap. They will come and they will pour out to you. The Bible says that God allows the unrighteous to store wealth to give to the righteous. So I have to sow a seed. I have to sow something in order to reap something. Amen. The problem with a lot of folk is we want to reap something before we sow something or we want to reap something without sowing anything. And we, we just think that God should violate his own law. But I'm here to tell you, he doesn't. There are people that are living in a financial uh, a distressed state that God has never intended you to be there. But you have put yourself there because you've broken the law of the kingdom. And in so doing, you put yourself under house arrest. You put yourself in spiritual jail. You put yourself, well, Pastor, maybe yet yeah, you still might make a dime. You still might get a little of this and a little of that. You might think that everything's really okay. I don't have to give God a, a dime. I, I, I'm making it. But you could be more than making it with his blessing. You cannot outgive God. I'll, I'll go way out on the limb, theologically. I don't know where this stands with you guys, but I'm going to go way out on the limb. I believe you can give yourself right out. I believe that you can give to the kingdom and give your way out of debt. Amen. I believe that. I, I, I have sat with people over the years, and, 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 and they've asked for financial help, and I've looked at their books and, I, and their bills and their income, and I go, I go holy smokes. Um, you're giving this uh, to God. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. But I look at the bottom of your balance sheet. You, you're in the red every month. How are you surviving? And their answer is, I have no idea, but every month money comes in, we pay the bills, we're doing great, we're just super blessed. They're, they're giving their way out of debt. They're catching 
cashing up on credit cards. They're making double pay. How are you doing it? You should be going further in the debt, but you're giving your, you're giving your way out of debt. You can only do that in the kingdom of God. You can't do that in the world. You can only do that in the kingdom of God when you obey his law. Yes. It's not my law. I can't bless you. I can't curse you. I can't do anything. It is not my law. It's a kingdom of heaven law. And you get to decide whether you want to abide by the law or not abide by the law. Now, I've sat on both sides of the fence. I've sat on both sides of the fence. I truly have. And I'm here to tell you it is so much better to abide by obeying the kingdom of law. It is so much better. Because when I do what I know the law states I should do in his kingdom, then I can truthfully say, God, it is on your back now. I did my part. It's on your back now. You get to take care of me. And I get to expect you to. I get to stand in a place of faith. And, 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 and I don't mean to be sacrilegious. I get to almost demand it. Now, hear what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say you go out and demand God anything. But based on his promise, based on the fact that he doesn't lie, mm -hmm. I can kind of demand it. You said you'd bless me mm -hmm. if I cast my bread out of the water that it would come back. You said it. I didn't say it. You said yes, it. You said I'm kind of demanding you do it. I'm expecting it because you said it. So it's really up to you folks. It's up to you. You know, when we don't call our offering an offering for a specific reason. We call it a deposit into the kingdom of heaven. And we don't browbeat people to give. We don't condemn people. We, we, we don't do any of that. It's, it is up to you. But we call it a deposit because you're making an investment into his kingdom. And you have a right to expect a return. You have a right to expect a return. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to give you the other two laws together. And we're going to move really fast and we're going to end. These are the last two laws. It is the law of peace and joy. Now, how many of you know that some laws are not meant to be obeyed as in a command, but some laws are there for your protection? Okay, you got it? Okay, uh, off the top of my head, we have, we have a law in the United States, the freedom of religion. That... that, that that, that's a law for my protection. It, it, it is there to protect me, right? I, I don't have to go down the street going, freedom of religion, how do I obey it? How do I obey it? it? It's there for my protection. It says that as an American citizen, I have certain rights. You know you have rights because you're an American citizen. In this country, you have rights because of your citizenship. You have a right to vote. We're all going to be voting very soon. If you haven't already, you have rights. You have a right to freedom. You have a right to uh, uh, justice. You have rights. Well, in the kingdom of heaven, there are a couple of things that Jesus gave us as a right. One is joy, and one is peace. Now, now, that's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of the world cannot give you that. There is no joy and there is no peace in the kingdom of the world. Right. You, you can try to get it, and many people have. You, you, you can try to obtain it in the world, and, and, and a lot of people have. You, 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 can, you can chase women and women, you can chase guys, and you can chase stuff. If I just get that new Rolex watch or that new uh, uh, boulevard, whatever it is, and, and that's going to make me feel really, really good. Uh, if I just drink a little bit extra, uh, uh, if, I, if I take this drug, you can chase it. But you'll never truly get it. Because it can't be found in the kingdom of the world. It's non-existent there. The devil made sure of that. It can only be found in the kingdom of heaven. And it can only come from the one that knew absolute peace 
and absolute joy. All right, so let me give you a couple of verses. John chapter 14, verse 27. This is so cool. This is good. He said, peace I leave with you. And I'm reading out of the NIV. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Peace I'm leaving with you. Okay, well, that's good enough. I got that. I got that. That's cool. That's cool. All right, awesome. You're leaving a little peace. I got it. I got it. But then he qualifies it, and he says, my peace. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dude, you just took it to another dimension. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It, it'd be like me saying to Pastor John, no, well, I'm going to leave you this, and uh, you do with it what you want. Uh, but, but if I said, no, 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 no. I'm giving you my stuff. Oh, we just took it to another level, didn't we? Oh, no, my peace I give you. I'm not giving it like the world gives it. I'm giving you my peace, which is a supernatural level of peace. How many of you are living in that? Not many. Not many. Not many people are experiencing that because you're giving up your right. You're giving up your right. That is, that is a right. That's a kingdom right that you have as children in the kingdom. You have a right to his peace. Supernatural peace. How do you get it? How do you get it when the world is crumbling around you? How do you get it when you just had that fight with your wife? How, how, and you know you're right. How do you get it? How do you get it when you've just been laid off on your job? How do you get it? Well, if I just do this, or if I get some, if I do that, maybe I'll get it. No, he said, my peace I'm going to give you. My peace I will give you. You get it by saying, Jesus, I need your peace to flood my heart right now. Uh -huh. And he yeah. promises to give it to you. All right. I don't know how it came. I, there's no sense. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. It doesn't make sense because right now I should be a mess. But I feel really peaceful. That I feel cool. My peace I'm going to give you. Okay, John 15, 11. I have told you this. That my joy may be in you. Oh, there it is again. Oh, you gave me your peace. Now you're giving me your joy. Not just a happy pill, not just joy. I'm giving you my joy. Is it possible to have the joy that Jesus has? If he gives you his joy, it is. So I'm giving you, I, uh, where was I? I told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and then guess what? And that your joy may be complete. Your joy and my joy gives you complete joy. Yeah. Now I'm going to give you one more. We're going to close. John chapter 17 and verse 13. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have full measure of my joy with them. The full measure of my joy. You know, when I read this, I thought, Lord, what would life be like if I could live life experiencing your peace? Do you, would you agree that Jesus is not worried this morning? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think he's looking down from heaven going, I just don't know how we're going to get those cars washed. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do today. <laughs> Oh, we might run out of lunch. I don't know if we had enough made. Oh, I'm stressing over this right now. How many of you would say, Jesus is in heaven and he knows everything is just okay? Yes. Yes. Is it possible for me and you to experience that? Yes. He said it is. The Bible says, a very obscure verse in the New Testament says that Jesus had more joy above his fellows. What that simply meant that as he traveled with the twelve and the crowds around him, he noticeably had more joy than they did. 
Now here's a man that knew that he's going to die in three years. Here's a man that said, uh, when somebody wanted to follow me, he said, I don't know, be careful because I don't know where I'm going to lay my head because foxes have holes and I don't have a home. And, but hey, it, it all works out. God takes care of me. If you want to follow me, that's what you got to know. And, and here's a man living that kind of life and he's happier than anybody around him. He's not worried where he's going to eat dinner or where he's going to sleep or, or any of that. In fact, he says, he says, don't, don't, don't be so concerned with those things in life. And, you know, consider the lilies of the field. And we looked at that weeks ago. And, you know, toil and spin, but God takes care of them. God will take care of you. Don't worry about it. He's living a life that most of us would have a nervous breakdown living. Would you? I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't know if any of you are going to invite me to your house for dinner today. I might be going hungry all day. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't know. I'm on my last pair of clothes. They've got to be washed. I don't know if I've got other clothes to wear. I, I, I have a belt now, and yet here he is. He's happier than anyway. Hey, what's going on? It's quite fun, man. Check it out. Tell that joke again. I love it. He's not depressed. He's happy. So the writer there says Jesus had more joy above his fellow. He stood out with having most of the joy. And then he says, I'm going to give you my joy so that your joy is complete. Is it possible to have the joy of Jesus? Absolutely. It's possible. So, if you are here and you do not have that level of joy and you do not have that level of peace, I think you need to stand up and scream my rights and then wipe it. I have a right to joy and peace and somebody has violated my rights. And uh, that ain't going to happen anymore because I've been given a kingdom right to it and nobody violates my rights. And some of you, some of you, if you went out into the streets of Fairfield and your rights were violated, oh, you would really, you'd throw down. I know you would. You'd be, you'd be oh, we ain't going there. Honey. Oh, no. I have a right. And you ain't taking it from me. You'd be out there duking it out with them. We'd see you on the front page of the Daily Republic trying to take my rights. But yet, when it comes to the kingdom of God, come on. The devil takes them, people take them, and we just give it up. Well, I'll just sit and be depressed. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just, I, I might as well just kill myself. We give up all our rights. Jesus said, no, in my kingdom, you have a right to my peace, and you have a right to my joy, because I give it to you. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to plead for it. I've given it to you. Yeah. Take it. Make it yours. Claim it. And when somebody wants to take it, say, no, 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 no. You don't violate my right in the kingdom of God. Jesus, give me some more. Give me an extra dose. Somebody's trying to violate it right now. Give me an extra dose. I need a little extra. When you go to work and, and that nasty person sits in the same office with you and they're trying to violate your, your rights and steal your joy and your peace, you need to say, no, God, give me an extra dose today because I'm dealing with Sister Nasty over there. I need an extra dose of some peace and some joy. If I've got to put up with her, give me an extra dose because I don't want her violating my rights. Give me a little extra today and we'll be over there. And I'm crazy enough to believe that he will do it even while you're dealing with Sister Nasty. Because he promised it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. And we're going to close. And uh, this ends our series on the, the laws of the kingdom. And I trust that you've taken notes uh, on your iPad or on a piece of paper. Remember, remember, remember these laws, these, the laws of the kingdom of heaven. Remember them because when we violate them, it really messes us up. If I don't love you and I don't forgive you, and if I violate them, that messes us up. And we wonder why so many Christians are such a mess. 
as they go around breaking the laws of the kingdom every day. They're breaking this law. They break that law. If I want God to bless me financially, I've got to bail them. It's that simple. I've got to sow into other people. I've got to sow into the kingdom of God. He will bless me back. People will sow into my life and give to me. If you're here today and you have no joy and no peace, while we're praying out, I would encourage you to ask the giver of joy and the giver of peace to flood your heart now. If you ask, he'll do it because he said he would. You're not going to get it from me. You've got to go to the, to the source of joy and to the source of supernatural peace. It won't make, it won't make any sense to your family. They'll wonder why you're so happy, why you're walking around with that silly grin on your face. And you should be all upset at somebody in the family. And you're just like all happy. Because you're walking in His joy and His peace. Father, thank you so much for the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the laws that govern your kingdom. We've, we've just looked at a few today, Lord. Over the last couple of weeks, we, we've looked at a number of them. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take those laws that govern your kingdom, just like we have laws that govern the United States. I pray that you will help us by your Holy Spirit to remember those laws that govern your kingdom. That, Father, that as we walk our life out in living for you and serving you and enjoying fellowship with each other, that we would be conscious of the laws of the kingdom so that we don't break them. Father, and as we obey your laws, I pray that you will begin to do everything that you promised that you would do within our life. I pray that if there's somebody here today and there's an absence of peace and there's an absence of joy, I pray right now in faith that they would begin to ask you for your joy and for your peace, Lord. Not like the world gives, a, a level above the world. A joy and a peace above what the world has. It comes from you because it is yours. And I pray that you will do it as you promised you would. In Jesus' name.